Very good evening from Archie McPherson. Ten days ago, the footballing world was saddened to hear the death of one of the most iconic figures in world football when it was announced that Billy McNeil had passed away after a long, lingering illness. Seven days later, we heard that a colleague and friend and the man who had scored the winning goal in Lisbon against Inter to win the European Cup, Stevie Chalmers, had also succumbed to an illness that wasn't dissimilar to that of his great captain. It was a double blow not only to the surviving members of the Lions, but to the whole Celtic family, whose reverence for these players has never diminished. Tonight we're going to look back at the lives, private and professional, of these men and the events which led to that historic moment in the Portuguese capital on the 25th of May, 1967. I'm in the company of colleagues of both who knew them better than anybody by having played alongside them over the years. John Clark, Bertie Old, Bobby Lennox, Jim Craig, and just arrived from Australia and telling me he's not suffering at all from jet lag, the great Willie Wallace. Lads, well, let's start off by looking back to the early days. Um, I'd like to talk to John Clark, who played a, very close to Billy through the years on the field and part of the Celtic formation. When did you first meet Billy? And when you did meet him, did you get the impression he was simply born to be a captain? Uh, <clears throat> I met Billy in 1958, October 1958, when I signed. Billy had signed the year before. And uh, we came for uh, Billy came for Bell Cellar, came for a village chapel hall, and we more or less travelled together in the mornings when we were full time. And you got a closer relationship with him than that, you know. And but Billy was—I'm not very sure, but I think he was out doing accountancy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he'd done it or not. I'd finished it. I finished—I can't remember. But we travelled there, and then, as I say, we travelled down a wee bit to View Park, where we picked up the wee Jimmy. Mm -hmm. He'd signed a year later, so and uh, it was quite a bus. So you, you got to know people sure. well. You got—you you started your bonding then. Yeah, and uh, as I say to you, you know. You picked up when you get the bus down at Bell Cell, then the next thing was a stop for Wee Jimmy at View Park. Mm -hmm. And the bus stopped there, and the driver always got out in the morning when he was doing the, his weekly run and walk over and knock Wee Jimmy's door to make sure he's out of his bed. Well, Bobby, you came, Bobby Lennox, you came from another part of the country, from Ayrshire, um, and you didn't have that car trip just uh, as they did. But Billy, did he appear to you to have the stature naturally to be a leader and a captain? I thought when I first met Billy he was terrific. When I played with Ardeer and Billy was playing with Celtic, he was actually one of my heroes. So when I got into the reserve team, when I signed for the Celtic and played in the reserve team, Billy came in a few nights to reserve games and always did a wee word in my ear before, before the game started. Just a real gentleman and really hit him a couple of times. We need somebody like you, a wee bit of quickness in the team. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully you can do it. Yeah. Your Bertie, a great man. Um, and I'm trying to ascertain to start off with whether there was an indication of that in the early days. Well, Archie, I was lucky enough that I was at Celtic Park the day he signed. He was just at the tunnel with Jimmy McGrory and the boss, Jock Steen. And right away I went over and says, how did everyone go, son? He says, I signed. And he, I, I was looking up him at the time, he had a tremendous mannerism. Well, honestly, he's a very honest person. And uh, I say they're delighted. Now we're thinking about players that played at that time, McNamee, Carrilla, and we're talking about all great centre backs, just something similar in age. Billy came in and stamped his authority over it right away. Mm -hmm. He was a born leader. Yeah. Jim, you met him under different kind of circumstances. Well, I did. In uh, 1961, I was playing for Scottish schoolboys against uh, England at Celtic Park and just before the game, they brought in Billy McNeil, who had played in the same competition or the same game four years previously. And they brought him in to talk to us as an example of what you can do if you stick your mind to it, because by then he was, it said, a half a Celtic. And um, that was, uh, and his words must have helped because we won one nothing. <laughs> right? um, so that was my first experience of uh, Billy, and it was a very impressive one to begin with. Willie, you were with that, and I remember watching you actually. <clears throat> in 1965 when Kilmarnock beat you uh, in the last game of the season, very surprisingly. I think Kilmarnock won by just uh, decimal points. 
uh, in, in the way the league worked at, at that time. When did you get the surprise call, or was it a surprise call, to go to Celtic? And when you went into the dressing room, what it was like to meet Billy? Yeah, my experience first with Billy was playing against him. I'd played many times against Billy and uh, always found him a gentleman mm -hmm. after the game, mm -hmm. during the game, both playing for our sides. Uh, first knowledge that I had about joining Celtic was in November in 66 and I'd already spoken to two English clubs to move south and John Harvey was a good friend of Jock Steen's and uh, John sort of talked me into go to have a little talk mm -hmm. but once I was there signed and meeting Billy uh, as the boys have said he was a perfect leader yeah, uh, John, the um, idea of Billy himself uh, is great, as it's great stature and so on, but remember, he was working under a very, very, uh, a brilliant manager and so on. Um, was Billy following orders, more or less, or did he have a mind of his own? Um, well, we've been asked that question before, and uh, as I say, I can never remember at any time that we were maybe at training, I were told by Doxneen what to do and what not to do. It was more or less the plan of the team we worked through and we played how we read the game about, you know. Mm -hmm. But we were never... I can't remember any other time that Doxneen drummed it into us that you sure. do this and you do that, you know. Yeah. Jim, you were part of the, the, the very important defence around whom... Uh, around Billy, playing in the centre of that defence. Um, did he influence you? Of course, yeah. I mean, the, the one thing that he did, and I think all the guys would agree with that, is he was absolutely magnificent in the air. And if you're a centre-half and you can win every single ball that comes to you, coming down through the middle, it doesn't have to make your life a lot easier than it would be otherwise. So that was the, that was his main strength, was the, the ability to win that in the air. If, when things were on the deck, he had John um, to help him alongside him. And in those days, of course, we were initially we were just recovering from the WM formation with the two fullbacks pivoted around the centre half. Mm -hmm. So if the play was coming down Tam Gemmell's side, I came into cover, and if the play was coming down my side, uh, Tam Gemmell came into cover the other side as well. And um, that was just a system that worked very well for us. But mm -hmm. I don't remember, as John quite rightly points out, us working very hard on it. It was well, something that we'd well, we'd done through school and youth teams, and well. and continued when we got to Celtic. Yeah. Bertie, uh, the centre half is very important. I mean, all the great teams, I think, had great centre halves. You go back to Santa Maria with Real Madrid, Passarella with the Argentinian uh, World Cup squad. Is it just simply a matter of clearing, heading, blocking, kicking the ball away to get it into the kind of midfield player that you were, just getting possession from them? He was aware of all, everything like that, and he was capable of doing any of the arts. He was, he was well before his time, Billy. And the great thing about it, he was very confident. He he was a leader, whether he, whether we wanted it or not. That's the type of character. And the most important thing, he got on well with the manager, mm -hmm. and that stamped an awful lot. Sure, but, sure. Well, and John and him, I'll tell you this much. At that particular time, I was so surprised that John and Billy never got as many caps as they should have done, mm -hmm. because they were the big thing. Jim came into the team, and he, honestly, it was because Tommy Gemmell played right back natural shoot you hit them for any angle and all and Willie O'Neill was left back and what Jock then brought in Jim at right back and brought in Tommy at left back and that changed the whole back four because we had nine potential match winners Billy being a big asset in the air Jim came forward and but, scoring goals and Tommy Gemmell I mean all you have to look at see if anyone else has scored their goals they'd been still raving and singing about it Billy scored an awful lot of goals for the air magnificent mm -hmm. but the marvellous thing was him being a leader mm -hmm. and we needed that because we had a lot of development devil, in the team we played to entertain Archie yeah I thought Jim I thought it was basically stature he had Okay, he was good looking. You can be pluck ugly and still be a good footballer, but <laughs> as it so happens, he was a, a fairly handsome bloke. But it was his presence and yes, stature he didn't, on the park. He didn't go around shouting and screaming, as you know some um, captains tend to do. Mm -hmm. Billy would have a quiet word in your ear, 
and um, that was all it was and that would happen at a corner or a free kick where he felt that we had to maybe change something or try something different but he just led from the centre half position that what I mentioned earlier on about one in every ball in the year makes a tremendous difference to oh a yeah, side sure. because it immediately stops an attack coming forward mm -hmm. and from there the, the guys in midfield like Bertie and Bobby Murdoch mm -hmm. uh, could pick up the ball there but that was the presence that Billy was he sure. won it in the air yeah. on the, when he was speaking to us I mean he didn't go for a lot of ranting at all it was mm. just a calm word well, it, it, does it matter? Oh, obviously it does matter, but how much confidence could you place in being able to go on the part knowing the defence was well-founded and established around Billy? I think I'll, I'll blow our horn a little bit. The front guys made it easy for them <laughs> because we were always available and they made it easy for us because they got the ball quick to us. Mm -hmm. Nowadays it takes a long time to get up the front mm -hmm. uh, to some of the games. And the defences are ready against you but we moved the ball quickly from back to front mm -hmm. and gave us a tremendous chance Now you'll, you'll have to fill, fill me in yourselves here because some of you made the transition from Jimmy McGrory to Steen I think you Bertie, yeah. what was the difference? What was the marked difference? Well the boss Jimmy, Jimmy McGrory was a beautiful man but really didn't do much, he was an elderly person and tremendous respect he got. Jock actually taking the training, went come down to the track and actually had that he was actually the one that was making sure that we were doing the right thing. Jock was the type of character that would speak to the experienced players, like a Peacock and Collins and all them and if they were an international a squad the day before he would say how, how, what like was it what kind of training did you do and he brought introduced us training with the ball at all times that was the most important thing he didn't want us to do maybe for 10 to half past 11 or something just running around the track and that's what he did actually and played and that's the way he wanted us to play the way we worked during the week yeah was Billy a leader in that sense in changing the way the team played I mean, it was obviously in harmony with what the manager wanted. Yeah. Um, and he demonstrated that in the field, didn't he? Yeah, the thing about it is um, when the games were more or less going against you all the time, you know, Jim said earlier on, and, that, and teams then threw in a lot of high balls all the time. It was a more or less a pick up for Big Billy all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, But Bertie said something there, he says, uh, Nine players in the team were scoring <laughs> goals. Who was the two that was left out? The referee was one, John. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, uh, listen, thanks very much for that. You know. <laughs> I scored one uh, counted right enough against the Hub, sorry. Yeah, but you know, uh, quite apart from inspiring you, he did score significant goals. Oh, yeah. Did he know? Oh, yeah. Bobby, yeah. Bobby. Well, the very first cup final, Billy scored the winner, and that was That's the most right. important goal we scored for. Yonks. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. think that team would have been kept together if they only won the match. And I know my wee pal here scored two of the goals, which is nodding to me here. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Rolls. <laughs> uh, and Billy getting the one was just proof of the pudding. You sometimes wonder why teams played against you like that. It was, it was, Jim, it was perfectly obvious that he was mopping up everything in the air. Yeah, yeah but it's hard for teams just to change their style. And, um, uh, you know, that, that would be the ideal uh, for a team just to have that. I interviewed Boss just before he died and uh, when he was manager of the SFA and he told me that the team that him inspired him the most was the Real Madrid team that won the sure. European Cup of Hamden. Sure. And he realised that night that with the exception of Jesus Santa Maria, the centre half, yeah. who was an out and out stopper, thou shalt not pass. He wanted one of those at Celtic Park. Sure. And when Billy was doing his job at his best. He was like Santa Maria. He yeah. was like Santa Maria. Yeah. All the guys round about him could get involved in a game, but you had to have the middle sealed up. And yeah. of course, he was helped by this man here as well. And getting the ball, Bertie, and yeah. you, you love simply the ball coming out of defence because that defence was so secure around him. Oh, tremendous. You had no fear whenever it went beyond the midfield. As I said, I'm glad that J John brought that up. I thought it was a great understanding 
Billy McNeil and John Clark. Sure. It was outstanding. I, I'm, honestly, I think that would have been a great thing for Scotland to think about, but they missed out on that. I don't think he's ever played together, John, did he, as an international level? No, no. You know, and that, that, no. to me, that was a tragedy for, for the punters because that was, I mean, that was a lock tight, that defence. Billy, on the other hand, loved the ball, but not at his feet. Majestic in the air, mm -hmm. climbed. It, it, was, it was doing the skyscrapers and such like that. He was, it was, and the big thing about it, his presence was always felt. Because see, if you were to, to try to take a, a kid on to the opposition, make an, a, a mug of him and such like, he was the long coming up and say, "Don't do that to your fellow professional," you know. Can anybody tell me when you first felt in that 1967 season that you could go all the way? I think, I think the rest of the boys would say, I think the Vojvodina game at Selic Park sure, was sure. the defining, the, that was the biggest factor of, of us going on to win the European Cup, because yeah. that, I would say that was the toughest game we they had in that tournament, you know, the they, yeah, yeah. they had a goalkeeper, yeah. we were talking about goalkeepers, yeah, and that, yeah. a boy called Ban Pantelic, you know, they were, I would say they were the best team we played in yeah, that yeah, European yeah, Cup tournament. Yeah. Would yeah. you actually say, Jim, that I, I know the final carried the cachet <coughs> of being extremely important, historic and everything else. Uh, without going into too much de detail at the moment, would you say the game was actually easier than the Vosvodina game? No, I wouldn't say it was any easier because the pressure you're under in the final was something quite exceptional. And um, I think we were surprised. I mean, don't forget that... But I'm, to, I'm talking about in terms of performance yes, because that, in the second half you were all over. Sure, them. but don't forget that, that you're talking a long, long time ago and I never knew who went to see Vojvodina. If anybody went to see Vojvodina, I presume somebody went to see Vojvodina sure. before we played them. Mm -hmm. But Jock didn't, didn't go into a great deal of detail about things like that. You know, It was more what we were going to do exactly. rather than what they were going to do. Mm. Well, I, I'm saying actually... Looking back on it, the game was easier than the Voz. I did the Voz Medina game. I was in the, the jungle doing the commentary that day. And it was seconds, a oh, couple of minutes to go. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And I remember Jockstein saying he had turned to, to uh, Sean Fallon. He said, oh, it's going to be bloody Rotterdam. Sure, which yeah. Is the, yeah. And then the corner kick uh, and the goal. The goal yeah. um, whereas in Lisbon, you had the lights of this tremendous effort that turned the game. A clock to Murdoch. In comes Craig. Kimberly scored a great goal. He's done it. Kimmel, a great goal. 17 minutes of the second half mark. And that could be the goal that wins it for Celtic because Inter now have to come out. Well, there we are. I mean, uh, at that stage, yes. I was in the commerce position with uh, Kenneth Goldson home at that stage, and you began to wonder, are Celtic ever going to score? The, yeah. Despite their superiority. Well, can I say that I was especially thinking that, by the way, having given away the flaming penalty earlier <laughs> on, I, I was really wondering how long it was going to take those forwards in front of me to score a goal. <laughs> Tell me, just, they, to, they, just they, to go to that, how did they, I mean... A penalty is a penalty. Yeah. Did you feel a bit depressed? Don't ask him what he said. Penalty? Don't ask him. No, what just when I turned round and saw his face, I said, "That's a penalty." All <laughs> <laughs> well, kidding, well, John. Said the great thing about that squad of players, they could score in the first minute and the last minute, yeah. and that's what was in the dressing room. But, mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't you say it wasn't uh, depressed. I we were, we were uh, in that final. Frustrating. We, I know, but. We were a, f a confident team. I was going to say, final. we were quite a cocky bunch. We were, but actually. that final, yeah. going out the way, going out at the beginning, we were a real confident team. Yeah. And we believed yeah. in our own way of doing things. And uh, I think it proved that, you know, if yeah. we'd have put our heads down when we lost that penalty kick, yeah. we'd have suffered for it, you know. No, yeah. we didn't lose it. We kept, as no, I'm saying, we're Jim really kind of, <laughs> as Jim said, you know, there's nothing wrong with being overconfident, as long as your ability is there, you know. No, and you had that ability, well. Yeah, the thing, uh, on that day, uh, nothing was different. The gaffer had all the confidence in the world in us, in the dressing room, and we all felt confident about it. And at no stage did I ever feel we weren't going to win. Yeah. I, I, Jim, am I right in saying you're playing down, if you like, tactical... Uh, nonce that the 
manager tried to pass on to you? That no, you just I, played the game the way you naturally played it? He didn't go for detailed thought before the game. He didn't sit the night before the game and say, I want you to do this. This is what we're going to do. You must stick to this. He gave us carte yeah, blanche. Yeah, he, he played the in our ability. The players were in yeah. their yeah. positions where they always were. Is, I know I gave away a penalty and I hold my hands up. But I, I, although I admit it was never a penalty, but I do admit <laughs> that I was the culprit. <laughs> my father, by the way, was sitting in the stand who had yeah. not wanted to come to Lisbon because he thought Inter would be too strong for us. Mm -hmm. And I had a ticket for him and a seat in the plane for him and I only persuaded him on the Saturday night before the gate, the Thursday, mm -hmm. right? He turned to Uncle Philip and he said, I've come all this bleeding way to see that. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, that wasn't yeah, very sure. good. So John, John, you were very close to, to Bill. Well, you always yeah. were in all of the games. You were yeah. his partner yeah. and so on. And we've talked about that, the importance of having a duo that instinctively can understand how to mm -hmm. play with one another. On that day, did you pass any words at all or did you just let the game... Uh, as I said, as I said to you earlier on, you know, uh, we believed in what we were doing. We believed in our own ability, because we had the pace up front. We had guys in the middle of the park that could pass the ball, mm -hmm. and we had people at the back that knew how to play it and organise ourselves. Mm -hmm. The biggest factor was when Big Joke would say, at maybe at half time, just watch that you don't get caught too cocky and coming forward too much and leaving mm -hmm. spaces, because that's how they played on it. The mm -hmm. cat and arch, you know try to catch you in the break all the time, you know? Sure. The, the, the heady goals that Billy scored, of course, were very, very important indeed. Mm. In fact, he scored a goal that many people thought brought to an end Alec Ferguson's career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Do you remember it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he wasn't marking him, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Bertie, you remember that? Yes, I do. I do. Uh, Scott Simon was the manager. A Derek White was it? No, Derek, 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 Derek White. Was it Derek White? Yeah, 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 I'm saying Derek White. I promise you. A goal in two minutes. That's right. Yeah. But yeah. But that's what mm. Billy's, yeah. honestly, yeah. his yeah. great yeah. strength yeah. was the air. Yeah. Yeah. Other yeah. than, yeah. honestly, he would yeah. encourage yeah. everything. Yeah. And the, the team, he didn't ask you to do anything, but what he did say at times, because as you know and I know, we played that open football actually and there were times people were just come carrying on and catching in the ankle and such like and Billy would say 50-50 win them he didn't mm -hmm. tell you how he win, win them but that's the type of character everybody thought I Billy was a, a just a big soft boy he had he, no, 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 he, am I right in saying um, he was only sent off once well, he got sent off at East Stirling. East Stirling, I know the East Stirling game he was sent off he was sent off in Bermuda and a friend of mine got sent off at East Stirling yeah Oh. East Stirling and Bermuda. Uh, imagine right. East Stirling. Absolutely Bermuda. disgraceful. Bermuda. Well, we don't count we don't count Bermuda, but Absolutely. East Stirling. Absolutely. East, Absolutely. East Stirling. Eh? We count Bermuda. We ordered off at East Although, Stirling. Why? Oh, I think he had a go at the referee. Oh, is that so? Yeah, oh, yeah. I yeah. Like spoke out of turn, you know. But isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing, Bobby, that in all the uh, difficult atmospheres, even the toxic atmosphere, unfortunately, with old firm game, that he didn't incur that. He, he seemed to avoid it. He was just a, a good tackler, and as the boys were saying, great in the air, and he was just he just had a good character. But the two games he was sent off actually were uh, Bermuda mm -hmm. and East Stirlingshire. <laughs> two Stirling. games he should never get sent off, and the other guys get sent off in the World Cup final, and in uh, now, what I'm in trying, Greece. Sure, sure. What I'm trying to say is, uh, as Bertie suggested, uh, nobody could be harder in the way he played, but there seemed to be a clean cut way uh, with him, Willie, that. Uh, I actually made even the opponents admire him. Yeah, he was hard to play against, Billy. Mm -hmm. You know, there's centre halves that it's forwards you like to play against them, and there's others you don't. And for my size, I wasn't brilliant in the air, but I could get my share. But never against Billy. Mm -hmm. He was always. I think. Uh, you know, sorry, John. I think uh, when Willie put, Billy liked the forward to be up next to him all the time. Yeah. You know? So, you know, it, but as lever as our centre half, our centre half's about when the guys dropped off, then you had a wee question, you said, yeah, Do you go short way yeah. or do you stay? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. these things happened a lot, you know. Yeah. Did you yeah, ever yeah. change did Jim, did he ever change anything on the park? Well he, he had it. Let's, let's, let's do something differently. Well he was the the manager's mouthpiece on the park and and he would occasionally, you know, maybe make a change or ask for a change or something like that. But uh, you, you must put the whole thing into perspective. We worked a very good, f f solid back four. Mm -hmm. 
to be quite honest, you know, where Billy was the kingpin. All we really wanted him to do was win the ball in the air, right? Mm -hmm. Anything on the deck, he picked it up. And or it came again on myself and we worked it forward, gave it to our old or Murdoch. Wispy said earlier on, quite rightly, that we played it quickly forwards. We don't, the, the, nowadays it takes a teams an age to get the ball from the back to the front men and all that does is it allows the opposition it's time to cover up, yeah. you know. We, well, we, we did it quickly. Sure, and you had to score goals like this, perhaps one of the most notable goals of Celtic's history. That was Stevie, of course, and, yeah. uh, and now he's uh, now he's gone. Bobby was a very close friend of yours. Stevie was great. He was a great guy, great footballer, really fit guy, scored goals. Stevie was just a gem to have to play beside. Mm. You know what? What I didn't understand, what I didn't know, quite frankly, was that as a youngster he had pulmonary tuberculosis, mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and and I never knew that, he he yeah. was he was Bertie. I think he was when. Days are dying, actually. Well, according to what we heard, that, that was true. It, it would come through, as you you know, actually. You don't know enough an awful lot about their young life. But I know one thing. When Stevie signed with us from Ashfield, he came up to the park. He was fit as a fanatic. Mm. He was the most honest person I've ever met in my life. Mm. And I'll tell you, every training day he was there, on the, park, on the track until such times that we come down. Stevie Chalmers was he was underestimated mm. at all times with the opposition. He scored. He scored quite apart from the Celtic goals. He scored. I remember another one he scored against Brazil. That's right. Yeah. When yeah. Scotland, yeah. Scotland well, he, they drew one each. One each. Yeah. And he scored the the the, 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 the Scottish goal. Scottish goal. Like yeah. But uh, my starting career with Stevie at the age of sixteen, I played a trial match with Rob Roy Juniors, and Stevie had just come out of the RAF. Mm -hmm. And we beat John uh, Pusley's father's team, Blantyre yeah. Celtic, 10-1. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Stevie scored four goals that day. Mm -hmm. And he was 20, 21, I was 16 or something. It's remarkable the young, yeah. you, the young and, and more distant connections you've had with all these yeah. players. You ended up playing uh, alongside, and, and Jimmy had great pace. He oh. did, yeah, that was one of his strengths, and it's a great strength for a striker to have, this, that speed of, and more importantly than the pace, he was quick off his mark, which is really something that uh, <coughs> um, uh, is a great uh, asset to have. I was going to say a sign of the time, Stevie having done his national service, that shows you how long mm. ago, yeah, 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 you yeah, know yeah. it was. Quite, uh, quite. Uh, well, they, and he seemed to dovetail well, John, with yeah. the, the rest of the players. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I say, had Bobby with pace, he had Stevie with the pace, and he had Jinky with the pace, with the trickery as well, mm -hmm. and he had Wally breaking f quickly for the midfield. We had a good setup, you know. I'm just looking at the film there. I didn't realise, but as soon as we lost that ball, we were after them again. Yeah. They, they talk about that now in football, but we'd done that way back then. Yeah. If you watch the, the film, the great thing about that squad of players <coughs> was that they were versatile. Now we signed Wispy from Hearts, and he could play three and four positions. Stevie could play outside, right, could play centre yeah, forward, yeah. you know, and we could go on and on about that. Mm -hmm. And that was the most important. Everyone has felt comfortable with that. See that team that played mm -hmm. without fear of contradiction. We were far superior than Inter Milan, mm -hmm. and we knew it. And Jock made sure mm -hmm. that we went out, never changed it in any way. Mm -hmm. We played an open game, Many, many team managers comes away with that now, it's such an important game. He yeah. knew our capabilities and gave us our head. Yeah, quite. Bobby, you were very close to him. In fact, I met you on the golf course. He was an excellent golfer, wasn't he? He was off one, actually. He was yeah, great. superb. He was a great golfer. He loved his golf. He was a 
the holder of the medal at, at Coda for four years. Yeah. It was really great. Mm -hmm. But Stevie, Stevie had great wee stories about him. He hated flying worse than me, Jimmy. Really? Oh, he did. He hated it. And he was in the RAF at one stage. <laughs> one of the services. <laughs> and the boys all kid him on it. His job was to keep the sheep off the runway. <laughs> <laughs> so but he just hated flying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, my first ever trip with Celtic, actually, was to um, Tbilisi in Georgia. And uh, I was in a window seat, and Bobby Murdoch was next to me, and Stevie Chalmers was on the other side. And Stevie kept asking me what I could see out the window. And I said, Do you know what to sit here? He says, No, no, I prefer to sit here where I can make a bolt for it if anything <laughs> goes wrong. <laughs> and I often wondered where he was going to bolt to. Uh, yeah. And I mean, you all had these idiosyncrasies oh, yes, that, yes. You, that you understood. And I think, I remember uh, Billy himself telling me, I know it sounds very basic, and it might even sound like a cliche. But he said one of the most important aspects for the 1967 season was the pre-tour to the States. Mm, yeah, that's where right. that Where that knitting, he felt, took place, John. Yeah, um, I could tell you a story, but it might go on a wee bit. But no, go on, go on. Um, You're here to do that. We had a day off, and uh, I was going out to Belmore in Long Island to see yeah. my relations, and Big Billy was going to some station, but it was the last station in Long Island. Jericho. So it, we thought it was only about 45 minute journey and that. So I got off at Belmore after an hour and a half, I think, and I said to Billy, I'll see you later on. And uh, <laughs> the journey took him about four and a half hours. <laughs> so he, he got off the train and he says to the boy, the porter, when's the last train to back to New York and the boy says hi buddy you're just off it you know? <laughs> <laughs> so we had a deadline we had a deadline to get back in that night and I had just come in about 10 o'clock I got in about quarter past 10 but I didn't realise that Big Jock and Sean and Neely and Bob Rooney were sitting waiting for us coming in so Big Jock says why are you just walking about here and I tell him I say listen I couldn't sleep it was too warm in, in the, the room I says, he says, in America, the, the air condition's the best in the world, you know. And he says, where's your pal? I said, oh, he's up there asleep, he's sound asleep. I said, I come out. <laughs> and while I'm talking, I said, I noticed that, that nearly his jaws were ready to burst, you know. And uh, I didn't know till Big Jock says, well, turn round and take your pal, he's sleepwalking back <laughs> up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And all he moaned about was he hadn't eaten eat for about eight hours, you know. Yeah. So we had to try and get out and went up in the lift. And Big Jock's cute enough, he'd know the floor you're going to, but we walked back down the stairs all the way, about ten floors down, you know. And we went to two streets away to some diner, they call it. And that's where the big man ate after about eight or nine hours, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, uh, Steen knew all your wee foibles and what you were up to, Willie, didn't you? No, I never did. <laughs> no, he was uh, a bit shrewd on that. You thought you had one up on him. I remember John here, who was pal Billy in, in, in Montevideo, and we were sitting down the stairs in the bar, and he looked up the, this ladder with a stair, and he said, the big guy's gone to bed, and the voice came down, and he says, no, he's still standing up here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I, I got to know Billy particularly well when he joined the BBC, and I did a lot of commentaries with yeah. him. He was my co-commentator, especially during the World Cup in 1982. Um, I remember the, the ticket frack I we had outside Seville when your son came to me and said somebody had been selling tickets and the police were after him. I, I, I don't know what you remember. After them, was uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, one of the stories he told, he was never indiscreet, I have to say this, but one of the stories he did tell me himself was that you were all grumping about wages and he decided to go in and see Steen. <laughs> he got one sentence out with the word wages and he was told <laughs> to shove it. Ah, right. But he, he couldn't go back after a couple of minutes. So he sat in the toilet for about <laughs> 20 minutes before he went back in and told you he had deliberated with the boss. And so, you know. <laughs> so he was picking up things, Bertie, from Steen himself, who was a cunning man. Ah, well, there, I must admit, I felt as if they were very, very friendly as captain and also manager. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the two of them got on really well. 
Billy was the type of character that could have kept anything and you would never known about it, Archie. He would come in and he would tell us what the story was about who, when he was speaking to the boss, whether it was about getting us a rise or getting us a rise when it came to the likes of bonuses and such like. There were a lot of times where we says that he went into the toilet for 10 minutes, you know what <laughs> I mean, and never went to see the boss. But I think he was a big honest person, Archie. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. And And I thought that to the man that was with him, it was a great double act, and that was Clark and McNeil. Outstanding, honestly. I've only, uh, I've only one uh, regret that with Stevie. I know you're talking about. He wouldn't play me at golf. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you lost. And I always wondered why. <laughs> let me let me ask you about one particular game, which to me has always been a wee bit contentious, and that is the no-scoring draw against Dukla, after which. Jock had made the point that Celtic and indeed Bob Kelly said Celtic would never play defensively like that again. Jim, was it a defensive performance? I don't think we set out to have a, a lot of men, you know, back in defence. I don't think it was set out like that. I think we as players might have misinterpreted what exactly they, he wanted. They were a, to quite do. a good team. Yeah, they weren't a bad oh, side at all. But I can remember one occasion where I came down the wing with a ball. And I passed the dugout where the manager and the rest of the crew were sitting. And nearly, I only had CV Chalmers up front, so I kept going. And nearly shouted to me, keep going. And Jock shouted at the same time, get back. Because, <laughs> you know, everybody, I think, at that point was a wee bit confused yes, as to actually, what we yeah. were supposed to be doing and what we were trying to do. And mm -hmm. it, I think it was a bit of luck there that we got away with enough needs to Well, I'll tell you this, Sorry, Bertie, so, I'll yeah. tell you this, he's no joking. He came in at time up and he apologised to each yeah. and every one of us at the centre of the, the dressing room and he says, I must apologise. He said, I'll tell you this, you'll nev I'll never ask you to do that in your life again. Mm -hmm. As a football, and I say one thing about that game, Archie. We Gemini must have missed the team top because we never knew we to play as deep as we played. Mm -hmm. In those stages, in those stages where we sold to get away back and got fell in, we fell in. But after they finished up beside yeah. Big Tam and we Gemini yeah, finished yeah, up beside you, sure, yeah. it was yeah. because they played well, I think. But they had, yeah. as you said, yeah. actually, early on, they had a guy called Mazapus. Oh, oh, great Mazepus. player! That, that guy was a gifted player. He, he was, was one of class acts at that time, you know. Mm -hmm. And he was dictating the that game that day, didn't he, mm -hmm. really? Yeah, I think you must say as well, actually, the fact that we'd won the first game 3-1 yeah. uh, does affect your second it does. It does. performance, yes. you know. Won that game, uh, Archie, as well, that was the job he gave to me. Mm -hmm. Just stay beside him. Yeah. Try and You're stop well, the service to him. So yeah. you go? And <laughs> You're done well, didn't you? <laughs> but I at the end of the game, he yeah, yeah, actually it. slapped me. Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, you were mopping up everything. You were winning yeah. everything. Was there, Jim, uh, an element of strain in trying to achieve the complete domination? Or was it game by game? Just game by game. We never really thought about the bigger picture, to be quite honest. As John mentioned earlier on, we, the, the Glasgow word Gallus describes us perfectly, doesn't it? We were a kind of cocky bunch mm. that uh, thought we could do anything, take on anybody, and, mm. and it would all work out right in the end. Mm. And um, I think we took it just game by game and mm. made sure that uh, all our energies were uh, charged into doing it well. I mean, we did not have the best of uh, equipment, we did not have the best of boots, we did not have the best of training facilities. I've got, I can vividly recall this day, the season after Lisbon, where we're in the foyer of Celtic Park doing calisthenics, just bending and stretching. We can hear the boss on the phone trying to find us somewhere to train. Really? Barrafield was flooded uh -huh. for the second day running and we couldn't use that. He phoned Colvilles to see if he could use the bit of grass outside their pitch and we ended up Mount Vernon dog no, track. That's right, yes. and, uh, right. With the dogs running around the outside and us playing football on the inside. It's yeah. remarkable that you came through all that, Willie, to get the biggest owner of all. Yeah, well, as you mentioned earlier as well, I came halfway through the season, 66. Sure, seven, sure, sure. And it was the easiest job for me to fit in. You know, they just... The first thing Jock gave me was a list of people not to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a, one or two at this table that was in, on the list. But he, he said, look, you know, these guys work together. That's all I want you to do is work with them. Who, who, yeah. Bertie? Who were the the hard team? I'm talking about domestically now. Yeah. Because remember the quality of Scottish football in 1967. You had 
Rangers have got to a final. You had Kilmarnock. Dundee United. Dundee United beat Barcelona. Dundee were doing very well in the, in the first cup and so on. All these games were much harder for a Celtic team then than perhaps even now. Oh, yeah. Oh, no doubt about no that. Doubt. No yeah. doubt about it. But here again, I, I, I must admit, Archie, I, when, when I came back uh, from Birmingham to Celtic, I'd, I'd, re, I'd recognised some of the players that were there beforehand, you know, and the ones that had left. And Celtic had transferred the quality players. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But it wasn't until such times that Jock became manager. We knew he was going to be manager. Until such times that uh, Hibernian got knocked out of the Scottish Cup, he had to stay at Easter Road. Yeah. And he changed everything and he made you believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. He played a balanced team and individuals, which we were speaking about earlier. We had nine potential match winners, goal scorers. The only one was Ronnie Simpson, uh, you know, Jim Craig. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you switched it. Yeah. Well, you can, know, I, can I tell sure. you two That's places where... Thing, that, eh? Two I teams know. that you would just say, no, they wouldn't give you much, you know, of a challenge. And we did get a challenge. Falkirk at Brockville for a start. Oh, yeah. always, and always Airdrie at Broomfield. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and when you went there, they played as though it was the World Cup final, yeah. by the yeah. way. They're yeah. going to show these visitors oh, they were, that they're a good They were side, physically you know? hard. Yeah. Dundee yeah. United beat us twice that season. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. 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 Both, yeah. Away. Both games were in yeah. front yeah. against them, but they come back and beat us twice. The, the, here is the difficulty, maybe, for the modern game. It, the gulf between what you were playing at at your level, John, uh, and the European level wasn't as great as it is now. In other words, teams in Scottish football now have to do an almost quantum leap to get to, get, to sure. play against yeah. Paris, yeah. Saint-Germain, yeah. Barcelona and so on. Because you were playing at a high level, or a, uh -huh. a much higher level, it, it helped. Yeah. Oh yeah. The, well, the, the higher the standard is, the better you are, isn't it? You know, because you're more alert inside. Plus the fact is that you've got better players round about you and also you're playing against the cream of the countries and uh, it does raise your standards. Sure. Because if you're playing the best, you want to be the best because you want to b dominate them rather than the other way around, you know? Yeah. Bertie, yeah. have you considered the, the modern age? Billy retired at the age of 35 and I remember at the time... It was just after you'd beaten Celtic, eh, you'd beaten Airdrie 3-1 in the Scottish Cup final. That surprised me. We got a scoop that night mm. uh, when he announced it. Um, are times changing so much that players are going to play, one, to a much older age, and secondly, they'll go from club to club to club, unlike Billy, who was only with the one club? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, like everybody that plays at Celtic Football Club, you know yourself what you're capable of doing. And you must be honest with the, the first and foremost, the terraces, but uh, with yourself as well. You put your hand up and say, no, I can't do that anymore. The great thing about Celtic, Archie, is this. The reserve team today is the first team tomorrow. Yeah. And when Billy signed on at Celtic Park, I was out training with the boys. And you must remember, we had McNamee with Carilla and, and, and four or five really good centre-backs. And yet, Billy came into the team much quicker than the rest of them. Did he, did he retire too early, John? Well, looking back at it now, I thought he could have played another couple of years, yeah. yeah. But I think maybe he thought in himself he's achieved everything he wanted to achieve in football, maybe in yeah. winning all the honours and such like, you know. Less, less motivation. That's right, and I think, but it's never deals. You always think you can play a wee bit longer, but I thought Billy could have played another couple of But how of often does that work out for somebody? Do they mm. think they can play yeah, on a wee bit? No right. matter what your sport is. You know? I was still that's playing right. at the time, actually, yeah. and I thought Billy could have played in the team no bother. That's I right. thought he chopped yeah. it too early. Far maybe too maybe early. it was him no Bobby, you know. He felt that's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. What motivated on, him, you know. On, yeah. on the other hand, he had to go and make another life for himself. Yeah. And he, be, he became a, a successful manager yeah. with other clubs, Bobby. So, and uh, the, the back of his mind, obviously, he had a good education. Uh, he was yeah. very articulate. Yeah. So maybe, maybe it was right for him to, yeah. to go. He also yeah. must, uh, you know, come here with the, the benefit of uh, hindsight and say the family played a great part in that as well. Yeah. He always get great support from Liz and yeah. Yeah. and his children. And yeah. uh, maybe, you know, they might have said, Dad, you're, you know, maybe this is the time for you to go. You never know. But it, might, it must have been uh, sad to see him go, John, at that stage. 
Uh, you mean in his football? Uh, in his football, on yeah. The field. Yeah, as I said to you, but as you say, it took a, a right, the step he took into management was a successful step. Yeah. And it wasn't a step where he said, well, he struggled here and that. You know, he went to Aberdeen and everything went well at Aberdeen, considering the position they were in before him. Sure. And then they come back to sell it and he got the honours again at Celtic, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, it, it would have seemed, Bertie, that he was simply naturally born to be a, a successful Celtic manager. But he admitted to me he had difficulties with the then chairman Desmond White at that stage. And he deeply regretted having to go away from Celtic mm-hmm. to go down to England. Uh, it's amazing, isn't it? Because, if he, I mean, it didn't matter where he was in the world, Archie, particularly Celtic captain, Caesar. I mean, all we just need to do is take a, a deep breath and think about it just now. Mm-hmm. And I promise you, he was a very well-educated person. Sure. And he would size that up himself. And he did, no doubt there would, there would be other clubs wanting to sign him whenever he was ready to finish. But he himself made the decision with Liz. And he, he was very, very quick and determined that's the way it was going to go. Mm-hmm. Did he did he mention his family life at all, Jim, or did he keep it No, he kept family? it very private, but uh, they were always there for him. And uh, in a club like Celtic, you, you can't help your family coming to games and, and, mm-hmm. and things like that as well, you know. But, but you uh, think, actually, as a footballer, he's leaving, and then uh, within a year, he's away up to Aberdeen. Yeah. As a manager of a big club, and he done it successfully, you know. Yeah. He took the switch quickly and he, he adapted himself. But I think John, it couldn't have been easy to come back to Celtic again, where yeah. players he had played with, you that's know, were still here. Uh-huh. And you know, that's always. Is, it, is that always difficult, Jim, to come back and and, and be with players? Well, I've never been in that position, but I think Bobby has been. I found position. it difficult to call Billy Boss when he first came yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. You know, I've known him see for fifteen years. All of a sudden, he's, he's boss. But he came up the bus one night and said to the guys, you know, Bob has got a problem here, but it'll soon be sorted out. He's no been smarter, but it just so it, it took me a while to sort it out, but then it was fine. Mm-hmm. And it was fine him managing the team and telling me what to do and what we're doing wrong. It was just, it was fine. But then, Bobby, he would be looking for a younger generation to take over from the likes of yourself and, and carry on. I was going to cut me a lot of time, actually. <laughs> 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 he would have been, I would have been. I actually brought a player over from Australia, a young lad, to trial with Aston Villa when Billy was there mm-hmm. and I stayed in the McNeil household and I was here in the bedroom with Martin and the first morning at five o'clock I heard the noise and I said I'll get up and, Mar- and Martin says don't move there's four women out there and they're all fighting for the bathroom <laughs> 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 uh, you know uh, with the I think I've, I've made this point, and I'd like to try and emphasise it. He was unique, one-man club, Jim. Oh yeah, very much so, and um, a fantastic career. Seven hundred and ninety games is an amazing number of games to play for anybody in their career. It works out roughly at forty-six games a season. Sure. Now that is an astonishing level of fitness for a start. And at the top level, free of injury as well. You know, and um, and also yes, yeah, that that's a good point. He didn't have oh, many serious no, injuries, no, did no. he? Oh, that's yeah. that's yeah. a big factor in football, yeah, yeah. isn't it? But yeah. through that injuries. time, he's acting as the captain, and then uh, you know, and we're taking our lead from him, and he's pushing us on. Uh, it, it was a great role he was playing, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think people forget just how long he did play. Yes, and uh, and and always an inspiring figure simply by being there, Bobby. Yeah. Well, one of the best stories, Arch, is between the two European Cup semi-finals against Leeds United, Billy got injured and we thought he wasn't going to play in the second leg at Hamden. And we went to, went to see him before we went down to Leeds. And Billy appeared down at CML saying he passed a fitness test and the whole, the whole gang of the boys got a great laugh for that. He was a great leader. That, that in itself helped. That in itself helped us win the match, believe yeah, it or not. Yeah, quite against a great team. It, it got to the stage where, because everything was going really well, the moments you remember sometimes are when things maybe didn't go quite so well. And my favourite memory of him was that we went to play uh, at Benfica, uh, we beat him 3 0 at Celtic Park, get beaten 3 0 over there, went to extra time, and then toss the coin. Is that the toss up? Yeah, yeah, one of the last times that happened in but Europe. That, right? On that occasion, Steve admitted to me. He couldn't look at the toss-up. <laughs> he left it to Billy. Yeah. Well, the next morning, we were getting on the bus. I was on the bus. I was sitting halfway down the bus, and Billy got on, and Sir Robert Kelly, just been knighted by that time, was sitting in the front, looking straight ahead. And as Billy passed him by, ever a diplomat, he said to him, 
I'm sorry, Mr. Kelly, if we disturbed you last night with the noise coming from our rooms because we had a wee celebration that night yeah. after winning the game. Sure. And Sir Robert Kelly said, I don't know what you were celebrating anyway. And Billy just quite uh, easily well, just might go to seat. Exactly. That's, <laughs> that's a very good point because you always found Billy, I found him as a broadcaster working with me at the BBC. He got on with absolutely everything, mm. even those people who were um, obviously supporters. And, and, they know, and even when we went to a game where it was a um, uh, Rangers were involved, and he did commentaries on these games. Nobody ever shouted at him. No, he never no, got no. any abuse no. from anybody. Now, John, that's remarkable in itself. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But that tells the standard of person he was, you know, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the respect you got, not only for Celtic, but you got respect for sure. more or less the Scottish football yeah. support, you know. Sure. And well, but even when I, I tra you travelled to England a lot, you know, and he was, he was recognised all the time, you know. Yeah. This is before he went to the management side, I'm talking when we were at Celtic, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we were down to England, that, it, was, it was well thought of, you know. Well, the last few days have been remarkable, really. A number of yeah. people have come up to me yeah. uh, and, you know, expressed their condolences for Billy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I know that not all of them are Celtic fans. No. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know... I'm right. Oh, no, it's a universal thing. I mean, it, yeah. I think Inter Milan have responded as yeah, well. So, yeah. And uh, maybe, uh, I think somebody is coming to the funeral from from Milan. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, yeah. So, yeah. so, so I understand. So that there is this universal uh, expression of grief I won't touch too much because I don't think it's appropriate on the on the uh, on the kind of illness that both Stevie and uh, uh, Bella. And, and Billy uh, had. Yeah. But I always found it sad, and I found it with wee Jimmy. I found it with Baxter. Uh, yeah. Seeing great athletes run down, sure. and you could see they were becoming almost dehumanised because of their illnesses yeah. and so on. Yeah. Uh, and it's one of the pathetic sides of football of of any sport. To see anybody John degenerating yeah. like that. Yeah, I yeah. know. It's sad. It, it's harder for the family, surely. Sure, you know? It sure. must be, you know, especially your wife and children that, you know, plus the fact going to visit you all the time and come back and seeing what you are, you know. Yeah. But um, one of his biggest things I thought is uh, he loved a fast car, you know. Yeah, I've been in the car a few times with people and that, but he's. That's he, why the name C Caesar came in. That's it. it. Yes, it was. Because I tell the, you what, you like to put the boot down, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the big thing about him actually was, if you think about, the, the, we were speaking about the attendance he had playing for Celtic. Now, his wife and the family must have missed an awful lot in that time. Yeah. You know, and then when he becomes manager, it's not just five, six hours, it's 24 hours a day you're, you're there. Tell me, do, do, do you f I personally find this very difficult now. When I'm asked about the past, comparing past with present, because the game gave me a, a great living. No question at all. I'm a very fortunate man in, in that respect. But I have to say, I have to be very honest about standards. And Billy McNeil reached a pinnacle and you begin to say to yourself, could anybody with the rest of you, could anybody ever reach out again, Jim? Well, it's, it would be unlikely, really, for um, a player to have the career. I, I mentioned earlier on, 790 games, 46, goal, 46 games a season. Quite remarkable, to be quite honest. I, d I doubt whether that will, will happen again. So, you've got to look at it as well. The game has changed that much. Mm -hmm. the, we all came from a working-class background. Really, you think, it, you, you know, sure, we're talking sure, about sure. You see, it's a more a, more a middle class. It uh, is now, yes. No, and that's a big difference, I think. You know. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Well, it's, it's 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 not just about money, but when you compare the Lisbon Lions and the team that Billy led to say a very good team, Manchester City, yeah. it's like comparing something real with something plastic. Yeah, but something must be done about it. You can't afford to have certain teams be able to pump unlimited no. supplies yeah. of money into it. So that's got to be looked at. We've also got to look at the injuries, you know, um, and see if anything can be done to ameliorate, uh, ameliorate those because, I mean, two of our guys going in a week through motor neurons, uh, through uh, senile dementia, and mm -hmm. uh, Alzheimer's disease, you know, and I know, there's something wrong somewhere. Yes, I know two others about which there are worries as yes, well. Yeah. 
yeah. players in the same kind of category. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so all that needs to be assessed. It does. Uh, 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 it does. A professional However, let, let's look on the positive side of all this. Um, we are now associated, you much more than myself, but me as a commentator, having been in Lisbon and so on, with one of the great sporting events associated with British sport, John. And it's great to even still be talking about it now. I think it's tremendous, honestly. It's, there's never a day goodbye, even just now, even with the deaths and that, you know, you've met a lot of folk, but before that, there are always people coming up to you say either say their father was at the game or mm. their brother, at, and they're proud to tell you all the time, yeah, you know. Sure, and sure. Uh, you get great satisfaction for all yeah. it, you know. Well, it's, it's like living a life story again, isn't it? When you think well, back on it. I've always felt privileged to the fact that I joined Celtic Football Club and so I won every honour I could in Scotland, mm -hmm. you know, uh, within six months. And the squad, as I say, we went on, what, nine years, seven to nine years? Mm -hmm. And we spoke a wee bit earlier about the players being at the club. I think there was a lot of the players who moved on would have liked to have stayed on. Yeah. You know, and, Bob, and finished exactly. their career. Bobby, a, 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 a club like Celtic has to look forward, obviously, all the time. It's a different age, money matters and so on. Um, but there's always a case of looking back. Oh, definitely. I think, I mean, this is a real close-knit bunch of guys that we've always had. I think the boys playing nowadays wouldn't even recognise each other in 10 years' time. But we've been, we've been all over the world together, played loads of games together, big games, put our trust in each other. It was just... It, any time you have meetings like this, Jim, and you've had a, a good few th through the years, is it a kind of regeneration? Oh, it is. I mean, um, we see each other quite a lot, but it's always nice to get together. And um, it was such an iconic day mm. in Scottish football sure. history, British football history, Western Europe football history. I mean, after we did it, um, you know, the uh, Man United won it the next year, and then a rare interlude by AC Milan, but then Dutch teams took charge, German teams took charge, and then the English teams took charge, and suddenly the whole thing had come away from Spain, Portugal and Italy. The, the Celtic opened the key? As a result yeah, of so that. You know, they opened the door. Game, oh, yeah, yeah, no doubt about game. that. Yeah. Archie, this is what I promise you. When we win that trophy, every game was so important. Do you know, it's a way of life, that cause, because sure. from now, from then to now, People will come and speak to you and we know what it is. And they'll say to you, is it all right if we get a photograph? Mm. I'd say to them, I'd be disappointed if you didn't ask me. Mm. So that was that and that is now. Give me a, Bertie, give me a, a quick summary of what you thought of Billy. Well, let me say this. As I said to you, I've seen him as a young man just standing at the bottom of the, the, the tunnel. And I went over to him, I says, do you just sign? He says, yes. I says, well, enjoy and make sure that you, you put everything you possible into it. Okay. He turned around and he said to me, this is the team I wanted to play for. Bobby, that sad passing of your, your good friend, what's the kind of sentence you would uh, make about Stevie? Just a complete and utter gentleman, Archie. Nothing was a problem for Stevie. I mean, we went away together, he loved a sing song. He, he didn't sing much, but he sung along and he, he loved it. But he, was just, he was just an absolute gentleman. And he was really proud to be a lesbian lion, I can tell you that. Yeah. You know, it's been really marvellous listening to you all again. We've only a few seconds left. My own personal memory is I was fortunate to be in a comedy position which was so high. I was very close to the cup presentation because Billy had to be taken around in a taxi by the police and so on. And I saw that cup being lifted aloft in Lisbon. I'd like to thank John Clark, Bertie O, Bobby Lennox, Jim Craig, and Willie Wall Wallace for absolutely marvellous memories of two iconic men. A well done, Billy McNeil. Fantastic moment for Celtic. And how well they deserve it. Everything they've entered this season, they have won. And so, there's the great team, Billy McNeil, takes the European Cup for Celtic.